Hey everyone, welcome to The Ridge Online. I'm Ben and we're so glad you're gathering with us today. In just a few minutes, we'll start our time with a worship set and then Pastor Tim will join us for a very special and inspiring message titled, In His Image. We hope you enjoy the service from wherever you are. And you definitely want to tune in next week as we talk about The Ridge at Home. Even though we can't gather together in our building on Sundays right now, you can still invite friends and family to join you at your home for church. Next Sunday, we'll be talking more about the strategy and vision behind this and how you can have an amazing worship service from the comfort of your home with the company of friends and family. If you're not comfortable with that yet, that's okay. You can invite others to watch online with you. Just text or email a link to people you know and let them know what time you're tuning in. No matter how you're watching, we always recommend using social distancing guidelines for everyone's health and safety. Recently, we started a new initiative called Change the Community to support our local partners. Throughout this time, we want to help these Christian-based nonprofit organizations advance their missions, and everybody can be a part of it. All you have to do is collect change in a container at home. Use whatever you got, a peanut butter jar, a Ziploc bag, a Tupperware container, and put your spare coins and bills in it. Then you can drop it off at the Ridge on any Tuesday in August from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. There are also other ways you can donate to support these organizations, like sending a check or donating electronically. Find more info about our partners and how you can donate at theridge.church slash change. Again, welcome to our online service. I'm Ben, and thanks for joining us. If you're new to The Ridge, we'd love to hear from you and send you a free gift. All you have to do is text The Ridge to 31996 or visit theridge.church slash new and let us know a little bit about yourself. If you haven't checked out the app yet, just search for Chestnut Ridge Church in the App Store on your smartphone or smart TV device. It's easy to use and you'll be able to stay connected with The Ridge wherever you are. You can also check out our website at theridge.church to find ways to connect with us and others. Find the care that you need, groups that are meeting online, resources for families, and more. Thanks for being here with us. We hope you enjoy today's music and message. Hey everyone, welcome to The Ridge. We're so glad that you are worshiping with us. We're gonna sing out. We are grateful for who our God is and what he's done for us. Let's do it. Let's sing, this is the day. This is the day that you have made. Whatever comes, I won't complain. For all my hope is in your name And now your joy awaits my praise I give thanks for all you have done And I will sing of your mercy and your love Your love is failing Lord, I Set my feet on higher ground. So here I stand. You are my God. Your faithfulness, my silent rock. Come on. I give thanks for all you have done. And I will sing of your mercy and your love. Your love is failing. Lord, I Lift our voices to Him. And as we lift our hands, the heavens open, heavens open. So let our lives declare the love our God has spoken over us. And as we lift our Heaven's open, so let our lives declare. 
face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Sing that again. The Lord.
Well, wherever you are today, let's take a moment and pray. God, it is good to worship you. And God, we are a scattered church, but we are a strong church. That's because of you. That's because of the songs that we sing. That's because of the word that you've given to us. That's because the spirit that you have placed in us. God, we are not alone. You are with us. God, we do pray for your blessing over each and every person listening or watching to this message right now. God, we are thankful that you are with us and you are for us. You were with us before this pandemic and you are with us in this pandemic and you will be with us when this pandemic is over. And God, we do pray for that. We do pray, God, that you would bring healing to our world, God, that you would enable those who are working so diligently for a cure, for a vaccine, for the medicine. God, we pray for that. We also know, God, that you can bring supernatural healing when it doesn't seem possible. So God, we pray that you bring healing and that you would continue to keep us strong as we endure and not miss what you're trying to do in this season, God. We are grateful for our church family. We're grateful that we can stay together. We're grateful for all of the technology that you've given to us to stay as one. We pray, God, as we come into this time, whether we are weeping or whether we are rejoicing, that you would use this time to encourage us, to build our faith, to remind us that we are not alone. We pray all of these things in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, good morning or good afternoon or good evening, wherever you are and whatever time you're connecting with us and worshiping with us, we're so glad that you're here. My name's Josh, and I'm one of the pastors here at The Ridge. And um, in my hand, I'm not just holding a jar of change, I'm holding a jar of life change. I was here on Tuesday for a meeting at the church, and my friend Bonnie came by and she brought this jar of change. And, and Bonnie, I know you're watching and I want to give you a congratulations because you brought in the first Change the Community jar. And over the last few weeks, we've talked about how all of us can help change the community by supporting our partners. And we're very blessed as a church to have some amazing partners who are working so diligently in our community. I'm thankful for Colleen and her team at Christian Help Downtown, and, and I'm thankful for Steve at the ranch who are, who are serving those boys, and Nancy at Compass who are helping women choose life for their children. I'm thankful for Karen and Libera helping women and teens, and Michelle at Trinity who are teaching for life. We're, we're grateful. And as we talk to our partners, they want you to know that they're grateful for your support. They're grateful for your financial support. They're grateful for your prayer support. So we invite you to be a part of this Change the Community effort. You can bring your change to the church on any Thursday or any Tuesday during the month of August from 11 to 1. We'll be here, and we would love to receive your change. And if you want to give in other ways, you can go to the ridge.church slash change to be a part of that. So we're grateful for your investment in the community. We're also grateful for your investment in our church community. It's because of your giving that we can continue to fulfill our mission, which is to lead people into a growing relationship with God and others. And we're seeing that take place each and every day. So you see the different ways that you can give on the screen. You can go online to give, you can text to give or send it in, however you choose to give and whatever amount you're able to give, we're grateful. And God is using it to change lives each and every day. It's because of your giving that we're able to take a, a Sunday like this and, and bring a message that is so important for us to hear, a message that I believe can bring healing to our own hearts can bring healing within our church family, bring healing to our community, and, and perhaps even into the nation. So in a moment, we're gonna hear that message from Pastor Tim, but before we hear that message, we wanna ask you, and, and I wanna ask myself just one question. What do you see?
This morning, I'd like to speak about a subject that I think is very relevant for what we're facing in our culture today. I would like to believe that we don't have a problem in our country with racism. Certainly, people don't view and treat people differently based on the color of their skin, do they? I think the answer is a clear yes. Yes, they do. Yes, we do. And I think sometimes, yes, I do, though it's hard to admit I'd like to believe that the legal and economic and political and educational and social institutions in this country treat all people alike, regardless of the color of their skin or their race. But I've seen too much evidence to the contrary. I'd like to believe that I personally am not racist in any way, but I know that I can't even be objective about this because I am I'm part of a system that helps insulate me from people that are different than I am. The places I go, the things I see, oftentimes I'm insulated from racism. Another way to put this is that I don't experience racism myself, and so it's easy to conclude that there isn't a problem. A few weeks ago, some of the members of our staff and I met with some of the brothers and sisters of color that are part of our church family, and we asked them another, a, a number of questions related to the subject of racism and what their experiences were like. Now, I realize that we could have expanded this discussion to other races, but for the time being, we just wanted to focus just a little bit on the African-American community. We wanted to know what they had experienced in their lives related to racism. We wanted to know what their perspective was about the things that were happening in our nation because of the tragedy with George Floyd. We want to know what their experience was like here at Chestnut Ridge Church, and we wanted to solicit their ideas for what we could do in the future to begin to address this problem. I was surprised, shocked, saddened by some of the stories that were shared with us. For example, we have a couple in our church family that years ago was not allowed to use a particular restroom because that restroom was for whites only. I heard the story of a young woman in her 20s who told about an incident when she was a teenager involving the boy that lived across the street, the white boy who invited her to ride on his bike with him. They took off down the hill, and then he jumped off deliberately, causing the bike to crash. It ended up smashing her collarbone. To this day, she is suffering physically because of that. And after this happened, the boy who did this and the family, every time they saw her, would scream racial slurs. And they made statement like, statements like, I'd like to see you in a body bag. Most of the stories that we heard were stories that have taken place recently. We're not talking about stories 10 and 20 years ago. We heard stories about some who were followed in various stores because the owners of the store thought maybe they'd be shoplifters because of the color of their skin. Some were denied promotions at work or were taken from one department to another in an attempt to get rid of them. One younger member of the congregation worked at a restaurant and someone came in and refused to be served unless it was somebody else. He did not want to be served by someone who was black. We're not talking here about the 1960s. This happened recently. This is in the here and now. Now, I have to admit that I have been naive when it comes to the subject of racism. I've tended to view that racism was a thing of the past. I've wondered, haven't we made progress 
Didn't we as a country elect a black president? Haven't things changed? I have naively concluded that we all have the same opportunities in life regardless of the color of our skin, but I have learned that that's not always the case. When it comes to getting a loan or getting a job or getting a promotion, sometimes the color of our skin matters. One of the lessons that I've learned recently is this, that it's possible to be racist but not even know it. To realize that I'm part of a system that favors one race over another. And so even though I treat people, I think, as equally as I possibly can, and I have friends that are of different races at the same time, I'm still part of a system that tends to favor one race over another. Now, I realize that I can't person, personally talk extensively about the subject of racism. I, I'm just beginning this journey to understand what it means in our country here today, what it looks like, discrimination. And to be honest, like many of you, when I've heard phrases such as systemic racism, I've become defensive. My response has been, there isn't systemic racism, but I've been slow to recognize that our system does indeed favor some races over another. I just don't know what it's like to experience racism because that hasn't been my experience. I only know what it's like to be white. What I can talk about this morning, though, is how God says we are to treat people based on what's recorded in the pages of the Bible. What I can offer is a biblical perspective on this subject. Now, I realize even as I'm talking about this, I'm a white male, and, and I realize that some of the things I say or the way I say things could be offensive to some of you. I want you to understand that I view that I'm in a process about this, and I want to learn, and I want to grow, and I hope that that's your heart as well. Now, recently, I've been reading a book titled White Fragility, why it's so hard for white people to talk about racism. In the book, the author Robert, or Robin D'Angelo describes some terms that I'll be using here today. Let me give you some of these definitions. First one is prejudice. Prejudice refers to a prejudgment about another person based on social groups to which that person belongs. And so we just make a, an assumption about someone or we make a judgment about someone else based on, on some social group to which they belong. That's prejudice. Discrimination is defined as action based on prejudice. These actions include ignoring, exclusion, threats, ridicule, slander, and violence. Discrimination refers to the things that we do because we're people of prejudice. And so we have a prejudice against someone and we begin to treat them another way and that's what discrimination is. What is racism? D'Angelo quotes David Wellman's simple definition. Racism is a system of advantage based on race. D'Angelo then explains it this way. When a racial group's collective prejudice is backed by the power of legal authority and institutional control, it is transformed into racism, a far-reaching system that functions independently from the intentions of self-images of the individual actors. I think part of what she's saying is that we might conclude that we are not racist, but we're still part of a system that treats white people differently, even if that is not our intention. We just don't realize it. Now, the main question that I want to address here today is how does God view people and how does God want us to view and to treat people? My takeaway today is this, that we need to view and treat people as God does. That's my thesis. If we discover that God views people a certain way and God treats people a certain way, this is how we are to view and treat them. This morning, I'd like to offer five truths that support this idea that how we view other people and how we treat other people models what God wants us to be doing related to how he views and treats them. The first truth I'd like to offer is this, that all people are created in the image of God. In Genesis 1.27, we read, so God created man in his own image. He created him in the image of God. He created them male and female. God created people in his own image. This is the thing that separates us from the animal kingdom. We were created to be very different from one another. How are people different from the animals in the animal kingdom? Well, in a lot of ways. First of all, we were specifically created to have a relationship with God. 
also, we were created with superior intelligence. We were created with the ability to communicate with God and other people. We were created with an eternal soul. God created us that way because he wanted to spend an eternity with us. We were created with self-awareness. We were created with a conscience. We were created with a free will, and I define that to mean we could choose for or against God. We are ones who are created with morals and laws that govern us. People were the pinnacle of God's creation. All people are. It's for all people that Jesus died. Now, you think about that for a minute, but Jesus did not die for the angels. Jesus did not die for the animals. Jesus took on flesh and blood. He became a man. He became a person so that he could die in our place and for our sin. And so we understand about the way we were created is that we were created by God. We were created for God. We were created to be like our God. And our value and our equality is based upon that truth. This is why, by the way, murder is so offensive to God. Because if a person is created in the image of God, murder means that you kill someone who was created in God's very image and he take it, takes it very personally. So who gives us the right to look down on other people? Who gives us the right to look down on someone who was created in the image of God or someone for whom Christ died? When I was reading this book, White Fragility, Why It's So Hard for White People to Talk About Racism, I came across the answer to a question that really puzzled me for some time. The question was this. Our country was founded on the idea that all people were created equal, that all of us are endowed by our creator with inalienable rights. And, and when I think about that, I wonder, well, how is it possible then that the founding fathers who believed this and founded our country on this idea were ones who promoted slavery? And in this book, Robin D'Angelo provides a short history lesson that answers the question. She noted that Thomas Jefferson, who himself owned hundreds of enslaved people and other people, in addition to Jefferson, turned to science. Jefferson suggested that there were natural differences between people, between the races. And so he asked the scientists to find the differences. If science could prove that black people were naturally and inherently inferior, then they could hold up these proposed ideas and yet have a different practice. In other words, another way to say it is as appalling as it might be, they believed that all people were not people and therefore they were not all created equal, which is incredibly wrong. When God says we are all equal, we were all created in the image of God. And so the starting point for us is to realize all people have been created in the image of God. But let me give us a second foundational truth that will help us view and treat people the way God does. Number two is that all people trace their lineage to Adam and Eve. In other words, we're all one big family. Today, even most scientists, or many scientists anyway, are willing to acknowledge the fact that there was one Adam and Eve. They may not agree that it's the Adam and Eve that are found in the pages of the Bible, but they agree that our DNA proves the fact that we are all related to one another. And therefore, we should not discriminate against one another. Paul talked about this in the book of Acts, chapter 17, verses 26 and 27. He said, from one man, he, God, has made every nationality to live over the whole earth and has determined their appointed times and the boundaries of where they live. He did this so that they might seek God and perhaps they might reach out and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. Paul noted the fact that from one man, Adam, and really Adam and Eve, God, created everyone else. Every nationality on this earth came from that one couple. And how God was involved in placing people in various places so that they might find him. Which demonstrates again the heart of God to reach everyone. Even though God is not far from any of us. It was the heart of God that all of us would find him. Now, in addition to the fact that we were all created in the image of God and all people trace their lineage to Adam and Eve, there's a third truth that should help us view and treat people the way God does, and that is that all people are our neighbors. In Luke chapter 10, Jesus told a story to his Jewish listeners that, have been, that has been referred to as the Good Samaritan. Most of you, I think, are familiar with this story. 
Jesus was asked by a, a Jewish lawyer of his day, an expert in the Old Testament law, he was asked the question, what do we need to do to gain eternal life? It's a, a great question. It's a question everyone needs to ask. What do I need to do to get right with God so that I could have eternal life in heaven? Well, Jesus flipped the question back over to the guy, and he said, what do you think? And the guy responded, well, I think that to have eternal life, you need to love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind and all your strength, and then love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus responded to that answer, and he said, yeah, you're right. Do this and you'll live. Now, I have to admit that I've often been disturbed by Jesus' answer to this question because we know that a person gets right with God through faith in Jesus Christ. You know, in John chapter 3 and verse 16, the most famous verse in the Bible, God so loved the world, he gave his only son so that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. And so we get right with God by putting our trust in Jesus Christ who died in our place and for our sin was buried and raised again from the dead. We put our trust in him to be our savior. So that's how we get right with God. It's not what Jesus said though. Why did Jesus answer this guy in this way? Well, I think it's because he wanted to expose this guy's need. He wanted the guy to realize that no one could do what the guy said. Who among us loves God with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind, all of our strength? Who among us loves our neighbor truly as ourselves? You see, Jesus said if we could do that and if we could do it perfectly, we would indeed earn or merit eternal life. The problem is none of us could do it. And when Jesus gave this answer to this guy, it caused him to reflect for a moment about his own life, and it did convict him. And so he asked, yeah, but who is my neighbor? And in response to that question, Jesus told this story. Jesus told this story about a, a man, presumably a Jewish man, who was attacked and robbed and left for dead. He was basically half dead, lying on the road, bleeding. Suddenly a priest came by, a Jewish priest, and he saw the man there lying on the ground, but instead of helping him, he just passed by. After that, uh, one of the workers of the temple, a Levite, came along, and he also saw the guy, but he passed by. And then a Samaritan came by, and the Samaritan saw this guy in his need, and he went over and he helped him. He dressed his wounds, he put the guy on his own donkey, and he took care of his medical expenses when they arrived at, at a place where the guy could stay. Now, for Jesus to make this Samaritan the hero of the story is a big deal because you have to understand that in Jesus' day, racism was prevalent, especially between the Jews and the Samaritans. They hated each other. Samaritans were a, a, a people group, Jewish people, who had married Gentiles. And so they were viewed as ones who had polluted their bloodline. And so a Jewish person who was devout would not even eat from a utensil that a Samaritan had used. And yet Jesus used the Samaritan as the hero of the story, which demonstrates Jesus' attitude. Jesus did not view people the way the people of his day did. Remember on another occasion, Jesus talked with a woman at the well who was also a Samaritan. And you realize that he had a love for people regardless. He didn't see people that way. It's like in the Old Testament we read that God does not look at the outward appearance. God looks at the heart. Well, after Jesus told that story, he asked this Jewish uh, lawyer a question. It's found in verse 36 of Luke chapter 10. He asked, which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The one who showed mercy to him, he said. Jesus then told him, go and do the same. Jesus was saying, we're not to discriminate against anyone. We are to view literally all people as our neighbors, especially if they have a need. Christ compels us to care for those that are different than we are. James, the half-brother of Jesus, put it this way in James 2.8. He said, indeed, if you keep the royal law prescribed in the Scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you're doing well. Do you want to know what it means to live as a Christian? It means to love your neighbor as you're well. Well, who's your neighbor? Well, as Jesus said, it's all people. All people are our neighbors. But there's a fourth reason why we're to view and treat people as God does. We have a special obligation to help those who are oppressed. 
In addition to the fact that all people have been created in the image of God, all people tra- trace their lineage to Adam and Eve, all people are our neighbors, all people should be helped, but especially those who are mistreated. Throughout the pages of the Bible, in the Old and New Testament, all over the place, there are verses that talk about the fact that God's people are to stand up against the injustices that we see perpetuated around us, that we need to care for those who are mistreated, especially those who are suffering and unable to help themselves. In Zechariah chapter 7, verses 9 and 10, we read, the Lord of hosts says this, Make fair decisions, show faithful love and compassion to one another. Do not oppress the widow or the fatherless, the foreigner or the poor, and do not plot evil in your hearts against one another. If we see that people are being mistreated in whatever context it might be, I think we have an obligation to stand up, especially that is true when there's a power differential. And so all people should be helped, but especially those who are mistreated. And then the final reason I want to give here today of why we're to view and treat people as God does is that all people are invited into Christ's church. In Christ, as Christians, all the barriers between us are removed. If you doubt this, consider for a moment the birth of the church. The birth of the church is recorded in the book of Acts chapter 2. After Jesus died and was buried and raised again from the dead, he ascended into heaven. And then several days later, about 10 days later, this feast of Pentecost took place. And on that particular day, and this feast, by the way, is called also the Feast of Ingathering. On that particular day, about 120 believers in Jesus were up in an upper room and they were all praying. And suddenly the Holy Spirit came upon them. And they began to speak in languages they had never learned. When the people in the town in Jerusalem saw some kind of commotion going on, and I'm not exactly sure what happened, but they gathered to where this 120 believers were, and these believers began sharing the gospel with these people. They'd come from all over the world to celebrate Pentecost. What's interesting to me is in the book of Acts, beginning in verse 9, we read a list of some of the people that were gathered there who heard the gospel in their own language on that occasion. We read they are Parthians, Medes, Elamites, those who live in Mesopotamia, in Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus in Asia, Phygia, Pamphylia, Egypt and parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. Have you ever wondered why all these groups were listed? Well, it's because God is making a point. All are invited All become one in Christ. There is no room for any of us to think we're better than anyone else. If God accepts everyone into the church, so should we. Paul put it this way in Galatians chapter 3, verses 28 and 29. He said, there is no Jew or Greek, slave or free, male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus, and you belong to Christ. Then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise This was a remarkable thing for Paul to write because in his day, there was a prayer that as a a Pharisee, as a man, he used to pray probably every single day. It's a prayer that some pray today. Nationalistic Jewish men pray this prayer today. I kid you not, as offensive as it sounds, this was the prayer they prayed. I thank you, God, I was not born a Gentile, a slave, or a woman. That was their prayer. And yet I read this verse in Galatians chapter 3, there's no Jew or Greek, slave or free, male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. The reason this is the case is based on Romans 2 and verse 11 where Paul wrote, there is no favoritism with God. God does not look on the outward appearance. God does not distinguish these kinds of things. He looks at the heart. There's no favoritism with him. So what should we do with this? Well, I think we need to view and treat people the way God does, that we need to use his example and follow his example. Now, I think the starting point for us is to recognize there is a problem. And if you don't recognize that there's a problem to start with, I want to encourage you to just pray that God would reveal that to you. And then I'd like to encourage you to examine your own life. 
and say, are there ways that I, I show prejudice or that I discriminate in my own heart and in my own life? Are there ways in which I view people differently than I am? We need to start pe- seeing people differently. And part of the reason for that is that all people have been created in the image of God. And all people trace their lineage to Adam and Eve. We're all part of the same family. And all people are our neighbors. And all people should be helped, especially those who are mistreated. And all people are invited into Christ's church. Now, for me, this is a time to listen and to learn. And for many of us, maybe this is something that needs to start in the home. We need to look for opportunities when it comes to our children to help them see the problem here and to help them love other people regardless of what their background is or what they're like or what the color of their skin is or whatever their race is. And I think it's also time for us to reach out to other people and maybe ask people of color their stories. And I think it's also time for us to fight against injustice. Now, this talk is just one talk. We don't plan, though, to just leave it here. Our heartbeat is to do some things beginning this fall, more things in this fall, where we want to, in very tangible ways, begin to address the problem of racism, starting with us and moving out into this city and into this world. Now, this morning, we're going to close with a song that we have sung together recently, but it really summarizes what I was talking about here this morning. The song is called Good Grace, and I'd like uh, to read the words of this song. At the beginning, it says, People come together, strangers, neighbors, our blood is one, children of generations, of every nation, of kingdom.
Let's sing this out. Sing swing wide. Swing wide. All you heavens, let the praise go up as the walls come down. All creation, everything with breath, repeat the sound. All these children, clean hands, pure hearts, good grace, good God. Swing wide, all you heavens, let the praise go up as the walls come down, all creation, everything with a bread, repeat the sound, all this cheer. we are your children we're created in your image let us love as you love we give you all the praise in your name amen thank you guys so much for joining us today and worshiping with us we hope that you were encouraged we want to remind you of something happening this Friday. It's called First Friday, and we hope to do this every First Friday of the next couple of months. But it's an opportunity for us to come together as one and, and to uh, worship and, and just be together. Uh, socially distant, of course. We're going to do it outside in our parking lot. But it's going to be a time of worship, time of encouragement. And it's going to happen the first one this Friday at 7 p.m. We hope that you can join us and be a part of it. We will see you next week. Thank you for gathering with us online. We're so grateful for your support of The Rich throughout this time. Thank you for your continued generosity. To give to The Rich today, go to theridge.church slash give. If this is your first time tuning in, or you recently started joining us, text The Ridge to 31996 or visit theridge.church slash new to let us know. We'd love to hear from you. You can also find the prayer and care that you need. Visit theridge.church slash prayer request and let us know how we can support you. We hope you have a great week and we'll see you online next Sunday.